The following prescribed is transcribed. Monkeying around, <laughs> you get it? Monkeying around, all right. The time has come for scary things, like horrible movies and vampire wings, with guest coffin openers to make you all scream, like Chase and Mitchell, show business hottest cover in hey, hey, ow, listen, as long as you got your heads off, you want to see hers off too, huh? Yes. yes. So step out there, sweetie, and let's take it off, take the head off anyway, huh? Hey. Oh. Wagon. This young lady is actually part of the great show at the Comedy Corner at the Arlington Towers Hotel. Uh, Mitchell Chase, introduce the young lady. Ladies and gentlemen, Shoshana Rogers. Shoshana Rogers, huh? Shoshana Rogers. And we'd like to have you, Rogers, huh? okay. right. like to have you come out and see her voice. See her voice. She's terrific. I said it, voice. V-O-Y-C-E. Tell us, would you set the, set the stage for tonight's feature? For tonight's feature comes to us from Washington, D.C. 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 A documentary on the Vice President of the United States, Shapiro T. Agnew. Wait a minute, wait a minute. How'd you get Shapiro in there? Isn't he one of your people? Not yet. <laughs> anyway. Mr. Agnew goes very often to the statue of Abraham Lincoln for inspiration. He looks up at the statue and says, what should I do? What? The statue looks down and replies, go to the theater. Go to the theater. <laughs> <laughs> Just as well for them, they're not. Poor things. The deaths of those girls must be avenged tonight. We'll kill those monsters. Well, we've got to try and find them. They mustn't escape. Come on, let's go. Where are they? I saw him with my own eyes. He was running away with a woman. Then he disappeared. If all goes well for us this time, they won't be able to get away from us tonight. If I find them, I'll stab them with this pitchfork. Mark my words. I'll make him pay for killing my sister. It's the only way to destroy these monsters forever. Did you see anything? No. No. We better try to make a break for it. Otherwise, they're sure to catch us. Bring a torch over here. Really, where's Oh, there they are. They're getting away. Come on.
must reach the grounds of the castle before daybreak. I risk breaking this old carriage and destroying these horses. I will give you gold to get a completely new carriage and a new team of horses. You must try harder. My life may be at stake. I'll try, but at your expense. Oh! Oh! Daybreak is not far away. Move now, give me a hand here. All right, all right. It's true what I've heard, that all madmen are not locked in the madhouse. Now, ah, Beauty, come on. It's home now. marvelous idea of yours to spend some time in this wonderful castle. How romantic it all is, Louise. You are so fortunate. Both gone. Romantic? Ah, yes. But only I know what it took to make it become what it is tonight. You should have seen what state it was reduced to. The house was covered with cobwebs and dust. I'll admit my first impression was discouraging. But then I heard a voice calling me. A strange sensation. The voice was saying, stay here. The voice you heard was mine, dear. This place pleased me at once. And I'm so glad you, you liked do. it. I well, think it's beautiful. Louise and I are oh, yes, honored that you were here tonight. Oh. Thank you. These are for you, Louise. Thank you, Racy. I hope you like them. Thank you. And thank you, Corinne. You've met my governess, haven't you? And this pretty little girl is the gardener's daughter. You may stay if you want to. Thank you. Excuse me, I must attend to a few things. My governess, Corinne, is also a very good friend of mine. And now Louise must play for us. I'd love to. Come now, let's go and hear my wife play. Herman, here, please. You wanted me, sir? I want a bottle of the best claret from the wine cellar.
Yes, one of the saddest stories of the year, isn't it, ah? Oh. Sad. But listen, don't believe the dumb headline. It's not true. I mean, I don't even know Richard Burton. <laughs> you get it? Uh, listen, seriously, I'm not going to do any of those dumb Liz Taylor jokes like, like, uh, the, you know, the one Liz Taylor has a set of towels marked his, hers, and next. I'm not going to do one of those. Here, Don, throw a chicken at me, quick, because on the punchline of the joke, thanks a lot. Okay, cool it. Anyway, I'd like to tell you how I feel about Liz Taylor. Musically. With a little song that goes something like this. Actually, it goes exactly like this. Well, now, I'll admit that I'm not tall or handsome. I'll admit my hair is getting thin. And I'm getting kind of fat and some other stuff like that. So you wonder why I sit and slyly grin. Ah, six flying fingers. It's just because, allegedly, Liz got around to Nikki Hilton and Michael Todd and Wilding make three she got around to Fisher she got around to Burton so I'm certain she'll get around to me in time so I'm sitting here waiting in my dungeon as happy and confident as can be and i never go on dates i just sit right here and wait because i know she's gonna get around to me two three four well now some people say sven Bully or a mary they say zelda be the perfect one for me huh? <laughs> yes but i tell them how it is I just got to wait for Liz Cause I know she's gonna get around to me In Vista Vision I know she's gonna get around to me Yes sir! Thank you! Thank you very much! Thank you! Call it! It's all right! Thank you! Bravo, Louis. A composition worthy of a great master. What gave you your inspiration? It was this house. The atmosphere of the park. Excuse me, Wolfgang. I'm feeling a bit dizzy. My brain's swimming. Since it's our party, surely we ought to open the ball together. They will understand, my dear. Later. But you must dance, please. Why don't you come and sit down, Louise? I won't be gone long. to know him, Marquisa. No, Wolfgang. Perhaps he's a friend of Count Hellman.
Oh, don't say what What were you I saying, Marquesa? Aren't you jealous, Wolfgang? Uh, of course not. Huh. I think he's fascinating. Personally, I'd say he's sinister. Very much so. Well, what's your opinion? I do wish he'd chosen me instead of Louise. You're chattering away like silly school children, but who is he? It's nothing. You must all go on with the party. I've had a bit too much excitement. I'll go to my bedroom for a moment. Please dance and enjoy yourself. Wolfgang will remain with I'll you. come with you. Excuse me. How is Louise? Poor thing. These last few days, she was so worried about the party, she tired herself too much. Could there be a little stranger on the way? It would be such a pleasure for everyone at the party. We do want to know the truth. Please tell us. We're friends. We won't say a word. Now you must tell all of us. Ah, I thought I guessed your little secret. Splendid, magnificent. But she might have informed us all that pretty little wife of yours. Maybe I could help her. I have been a mother myself, you know. No, Marquise, I think it is simply this, that after all this work about the house, she is just extremely tired. And now, if you'll excuse me, I must go to see the rest of my guests. I do not want to offend any of my friends. How presumptuous he is. We were not like that in my young days. They think they know about all these things. They are foolish, and they lack respect. Have you noticed how she lets herself be embraced by that stranger while dancing? By the way, were you able to find out where he comes from? He must be from abroad, because no one knows who he is. The important thing is that Luis knows him, intimately, I think. I've no doubt my hunch is right. Did you see how fast he went away with the arrival of Wolfgang? A strategic retreat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'd be very interested to know where she could be found now. And with whom? you come here.
Louise, open the door. Is something wrong, sir? My wife won't answer. Louise, open the door. Madam, are you all right? Open the door for us. I'm sorry, I'd fallen asleep. I confess that for one moment there, I was worried. You are so pale. Are you sure you're not feeling badly? No, I was only trying to rest a little. I'm just a bit tired, I think. Tomorrow I'll be all right. It's best that you stay in bed tonight. I feel very guilty for having disturbed you. But our friends are waiting. Don't worry, I'll explain to them. If you need me at all, please call me. All right. Now sleep well. You need to get a good night's rest. And it's been a great deal of nausea that we reintroduce tonight's mystery guest, Coffin Openers, appearing at the Comedy Corner at the Arlington Towers Hotel, the comedy team of Chase and Mitchell. Let's welcome them. Here they are. Come on, on guys. There you go. Right out. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to sing a very beautiful song for you. What do you mean you're going to sing? I'm going to sing a beautiful song. That's what I'm going to do. And I don't need music. I happen to be great. You do nothing. Stand there and do nothing. Nothing at all. Right. And do it quietly so I can sing. How do you do nothing quietly? You'll find a way. Just once in a lifetime, a man meets Spanguli. One wonderful moment when fate takes his hand. <laughs> Take two, and you. Hi there, girls. Hi there. Son of a gun. Hi there. Just once in a lifetime, a man meets Spanguli. One wonderful moment when fate takes his hand. Excuse me. Will you follow me, please? Your rooms are ready. Come with me. Will you get out of here and let me I sing my song? I got a few rooms for you. Permit me to introduce myself. I am the Count. To be there. To be there. To be really there. That must be glorious. I'd like to drink a blah, 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 blah. To be there, to be there, to be really there. I'd like to drink a blah, 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 blah. And now, if I may. You may, you may. To be there, to be there, to be really there. Manish Tano Halalo has me call Why is this night different than any other night? I don't know, I'm not Jewish. What do you know? My priest knows more than your rabbi. Sure, you tell him everything. <laughs> the Jewish kid wins again. <laughs> you may. It was finally arrived at the lake shore, and black storm clouds were gathering in the sky. The boat they had expected was moored to a post, and the ferryman was standing beside it, waiting for them. He was wearing a long, dark cloak with a hood which covered his head, and muffled his voice, making his words indistinct. Bertram paid, and he told the boatman to leave. Before they were halfway across, the storm broke in its full fury. Lightning flashed in the sky, and thunder rolled. The boat heaved and lurched, and the passengers were flung from side to side. Bertram left the frightened girl moved to the ferryman's side and asked if they shouldn't turn the small vessel back. Suddenly the lightning revealed his features and he found himself staring into the face of his bitterest foe. That's enough reading for this morning. It's time for lunch. Come on, Louise. Let's go and eat now. You are very thoughtful, but I'm not hungry. Madam, please. You must eat. I don't want to. Now, Louise, you had better eat a little something, my dear. You'll eat for me. That's a good girl. I'm very proud of you. Why, my dear, that's more Maybe. like it. The more you eat, the prettier you'll both grow. Corrine. Corrine.
The doctor has arrived. You may tell the doctor that the Count will wait for him here in the garden. Very well. <laughs> Gracie, I want you to be a good girl. You see, she promised she would. <laughs> Count, yes, the sir. doctor has arrived. Ah, yes, he's an old school friend of mine, Dr. Hatt. It will be a good opportunity to speak of Madame's illness. Mm, yes, yes, that's a good idea. We'll ask his advice. And you, Razy? You aren't afraid of the doctor, are you? <laughs> You're a big girl now. He's a good friend. Ah, here he is now. I hope I'm not disturbing him. No, far from it, doctor. Please sit down. May we offer you something to eat or drink? Please, doctor. Nothing, thank you. As you wish. Have you been ill recently? No. You're looking a bit pale, I think. May I feel your pulse, please? Thank you. Your pulse is weak, you know. Let me ask you, have you suffered from anemia at all? No, doctor, not that I'm aware of. But you've no sign of fever. There's nothing the matter with me. Well, what do you think, Doctor? I don't know. Judging from the symptoms, I would say she was anemic, as I said. But she's always been so healthy. In any case, I can give a diagnosis now. Well, I shall come and pay her another visit tomorrow, and maybe then I shall be able to be more precise. Now, don't alarm her. Let her have plenty of rest, and above all, let her eat good meals. Yes, of course. We'd better go back now. She might get suspicious. Yes, perhaps we'd better. Doctor?
I knew that you would come to me. I knew you were calling me. Where are you? I can't see you. Who can you be to have this mysterious power over me? Who can you be that you poisoned all the love I bore my husband and made me become your slave? Show yourself to me. Where are you hiding? This black knight makes me fear you. The knight is my element. It cannot frighten me. You too belong to the dark, for in you the light of the stars is transformed into a being of flesh and blood. And what the night sky has lost, I now see standing before me, more beautiful than a thousand stars. All this I see in you. But I don't see such great beauty in me. Your mirror cannot show it. It only diminishes you. It cannot possibly do you justice. The reflection you see there bears no resemblance to the reality. Ah, could you but see yourself as you are in my heart? You might then see your real self. In my heart, you are not the woman that you think you are. You are a part of a greater mystery. Tell me who you are and what you want. I come from the past. I exist in the present and in the future. I'm here to offer you a life of passion for centuries everlasting. A realm which is waiting for you. A beautiful world of strange colors. Colors which as yet you cannot even imagine but which I shall teach you to see. They are hidden in the darkness of our realm. What are you doing here? I just wanted a breath of air. Now please take me in again. Oh! Louise! We got a flying fish, you get that? <laughs> no, no. Well, hello again, future Einsteins and Frankensteins. Welcome again to the Academy of the Alley, TV's favorite learning place, Sven Gulli Street. How many say yes? Yes, yes. With all the kids and, of course, the teacher's pet today. Ow, ow, ow! Janet Gordon, cut that out, would you please? Anyway, let it alone. Let's begin today's lesson. Ready, kids, huh? Okay, who asked you? Today, on Sven Gulli Street, I'm going to teach all you monolingual morons how to count in a new language. It's called Lawrence Welk Ease, huh? Or, as it's better known to millions, Wonderful Ease, huh? Aren't you thrilled about that, huh? Get out there, get out. 
Hockey Festival, let's learn about all the people who speak wonderfully as they live in the small Illinois town of Champaign, Illinois. See, where the chief export there is a kind of an axe used in moose hunting. It's also known as a Champaign moose axe. Pay no attention, doesn't make any sense. Anyway, the folks in Champaign who are known as the Champagne moose axe makers, you get it? Huh? You get it. Anyway, they spend their time here, take that, listening to the Myron Florin records, Blake breaking Led Zeppelin records, and counting in wonderful ease. For example, here's the number one, right? In wonderful ease, the number one is a one. See? A one. Okay? And the number two is... And a two. And a two. Okay? And of course, in wonderful ease, number three is... And a three. Um, okay. And of course, there are a few more wonderful these numbers. Uh, when my baby smiles at me, uh, when Bourbon eyes are smiling, and the two fat polka, what are the big uh, numbers? Thank you, boys, um, for those wonderful numbers. Um. Okay, far out, Larry. And listen, would you cool it with the bubble machine? <laughs> Just cool it with those dumb bubbles. Just to turn it off. Anyway, goodbye, boys and girls, Dad. <laughs> Sven Gulli Street was made yes. probable by a special grant from the Stephen Foster Foundation. Say, was that Sven Gulli in the Foster Grant? <laughs> in the Foster it wasn't Grant. Captain Kangaroo, sweetie. How do you like that? Bloody bubble. Nothing. <laughs> Excuse me, Louise. I'll go with the doctor to the door. Doctor. Goodbye. Medical science can't be of any further use. She has no obvious malady, but she might be dying. Listen to me, Wolfgang. There's only one chance of saving her. Take your carriage and leave immediately. Go to Vienna. Ask for Professor Nitsch. He could help her. I confess I'm beaten. It's a bitter blow after all these long years as a doctor to have to admit I'm defeated. Go now. Don't waste any more time. Goodbye, Wolfgang. <laughs> that you will soon be better. Louise, dearest, I have to go to Vienna. Tell the coachman to prepare the carriage. I must go and buy your new medicine and tomorrow you'll feel better. I can't wait until then. I know it, Wolfgang. See the sun there at the window. My flesh is yearning to feel the heat of its rays. Wolfgang, do help me. Please, I must have son. I beg you, Wolfgang. Yes, of course, my dearest. certainly return before nightfall.
Dr. Nitch? He's not here. What do you want? I must see the doctor urgently. Oh, no, he's busy on a call. I've got my work. Please, wait a minute. Can you tell me if he'll be back? I wouldn't know, sir. It really all depends. He's only gone to a nearby town. They say there are strange creatures near here, but I don't think so. They say such silly things these days. <laughs> yes, certainly you're right, but may I come in and wait? You might have said so before that you wanted to wait. Of course you may do come in. As Dr. Nietzsche is always telling me, if anyone wants us, they must wait for us. Won't you come this way? I'll show you to his study. No, thank you. I prefer to wait here. As you wish. Dr. Nitsch also prefers it here when he has a moment to himself. Will you excuse me, sir? I'm so sorry I kept you waiting. Uh, make yourself comfortable. A cigar? No, thank you. Uh, what can I do for you? Dr. Hunt sent me to you. Dr. Hunt? Oh, yes, I remember him. He says that you're the last hope I have. My poor wife, she's dying. He's at a loss. Because although she's in a state of extreme depression, he cannot explain the origin of her malady. My only chance of saving her lies with you. I cannot do miracles. I can only do my best. Well, now then, are there any obvious symptoms you observe? Please forgive me. I'd rather talk in the carriage. She may now be weaker and even be... Now, don't despair. I'll get my bag. I'll be right back. told me about your wife's behavior. You haven't omitted anything? No, why should I hide anything? Never mind. The symptoms are pretty clear, I'm afraid. I don't want to frighten you, but your wife is threatened by grave dangers. There's not a single second to be lost. I'm afraid you're right. She seems to be growing weaker every day. That is why I have come to you, Dr. Nitsch. I put myself in your hands. Dr. Hunt recommended me to you because you're the only person who can cure my poor wife. I will do everything in my power. It is an evil I have been fighting for years, many years. And I shall have no peace until I am utterly destroyed. Otherwise, I shall have to leave to others the task of completing my work. You will have to have great courage. And above all, you will have to follow all my instructions, although they may seem to you unusual. It is not only a physical evil. To science must be added the power of faith. The most important thing is to isolate the patient completely. Nobody must come near her. We mustn't trust a soul. Is there any cure that can work, doctor? Yes, there is. And there's one important thing I must explain. It is vital when treating these diseases to attack the cause of the illness. But in your wife's case, that cause must be destroyed completely. They are 
are very cunning and they have perfected through the ages the art of deceit. One should be prepared for anything from them to have any chance of victory. Who are they? The vampires. The vampires? Wolfgang has returned. Who'll have the courage to tell him the truth? We'd better go down and tell him the news. How's my wife feeling now? What has happened? Tell me. Louise. We both discovered her in front of the window, with her eyes looking out at the moonlight. She seemed so peaceful. Uh, uh. No, Corinne. It's better to leave him alone for a while. It will be necessary to call a priest. Will you see to it? And your wife might take Razy home. It's better, I think. What a tragedy. Poor dear lady. Wolfgang, you will need all your courage. I know it's been a terrible shock. She's gone. What's happened? Quickly, follow me. Where to? To the park. They've taken her away. We must hurry. She's disappeared, Corrine. Disappeared? But that's impossible. Go to your room at once. Close the windows and don't move. There's no doubt about it. It's exactly as I feared. Now I think it's best to separate. But if you see anything, call me. I need your warmth so much. You're alive. I thought I would never see you again. Thank God for that. I've suffered so much these last few hours. 
I felt as if life had separated us forever. It was more than I could bear. I believe death was preferable to life without you, Louise, darling. Don't ever leave me. Let's go back to the castle. They're looking oh, for Oh, please us. wait a moment, dear. a few seconds, we'll dip into the old mailbag here and read some of your old dippy mail. <laughs> but first of all, as a public service, Screaming Yellow Theater proudly presents a complete list of all the swingers in Barwell. Surely. That's the whole list. Okay. Moving right along, now let's see what's on your alleged minds as we dip into the mailbag. Ah, this week's letter, blackmail from Monica Marco. Yeah! Daring to die, Monica, she says, yep. did you ever hear the Drano song? <laughs> the Drano song. I'm always chasing Drano, bad. Ah, hello to Jerry Lampman at the Individualist. Also, Miss Delvina Tredre in Cudahy, Wisconsin. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> Paul Marx in Deerfield, Illinois. Huh? Uh, Karen Harms in Chenoa, Illinois. Yeah, Dee. that's right. That's it. Dee Gornet in Huntley, Illinois, who's got a pet mouse named Sven Well, I love you. Very lonely in Huntley. Hello to Jim Hoover in Kokomo, Indiana, who says, what do you think of the drawing? Jim, it stinks. I'll tell you the truth. Hello to Leon Walters on Washington Boulevard. Hi to the guys at Zagoni's Novelty Shop, Lincoln and Belmont. And my friend Jerry G. Bissop asked me to remind you the big MD, Jerry Lewis Teleton, here on 32 next Sunday night, September the 2th, starting at 9 o'clock with Bob Clemeny is his co-hostess or something on the thing. And now stand by for the most exciting part of tonight's movie. In the next segment, we'll find out if this splice we put in it the last time it broke is going to hold. We don't know, see. We'll find out in the next segment. Because if we do, after all, I mean, you know. <laughs> They act with cunning, and we must be just as clever. You will think that I ask you far too much, but it's necessary. Tonight I will need you to set my trap. You will stay here and wait No, for Doctor. I you must understand that to me this doesn't make sense. This is ridiculous as well as painful for me. Oh, I know. This makes no difference to you. Because all that counts with you is to realize your ambition, to impress your friends and prove your brilliance. But you ought to realize that I, for one, have had enough of this comedy. Be quiet. Listen to me. I'll explain to you. It is not a question of defending any one individual, but of the whole of mankind being in gravest danger. We cannot remain indifferent to this. With your help, I'm about to kill this thing at its roots, so that the peril cannot inexorably spread even further. The moment has come at last, when vampires will disappear from the earth. Imagine all the children, all the women who must be saved from contamination by these monsters. They must be banished, exterminated without pity. Once again, I have to ask your forgiveness. I have no doubt they'll arrive soon. And I shall be waiting even if I have to spend all of the night awake. I feel I ought to say how grateful I am for what you're doing, Dr. Nitsch. I don't know if all these precautions of yours will be sufficient to keep these creatures at bay, but I have a feeling that all of this is useless. However, if anything should happen to me, I want you to promise to free me forever from this appalling fate. I can't bear the thought that I might have to wander throughout eternity contaminating other human beings. Yes, certainly, but it won't be necessary.
Would you mind if I stayed here for the rest of the night? I'm afraid of remaining alone. Poor little Corinne. These have been difficult days for you, too. Of course you can stay here. I shall be of no bother to anybody. I'll just sit here on this chair. Very well, then. You might be of help to him. all your courage soon. Any moment now, they ought to be here.
What's the matter? Corinne. No. No. Sorry for you, but I have no choice. God will have pity on your soul. Time again to open wide and say... Hey, please! Here's that cockamamie cook, the galloping ghoul man. <laughs> Hello again, fork flingers and fricassee fixers. Welcome back to the humble kitchen of the Galloping Ghoul May, also known as the missing link between dinner and the emergency war. <laughs> yes, today, the most important lesson yet. You mean you're going to teach us to eat that junk you've been cooking? Wrong, wrong, wrong. Today, ladies and gentlemen, meat substitutes, huh? Yes. 
As we're all aware, this country is in the midst of a meat shortage. You know what we mean by the term meat shortage, huh? That's when your butcher is Mickey Rooney. Wrong, wrong. You see, there's not enough meat available to meet, if you'll pardon the expression, the demands of the public, the price freezes, and the increased cost of livestock feed and slaughtering and processing have caused any meat that does reach the marketplace to be of such inflated price, it's not feasible to purchase it in the necessary quantity. You want me to repeat any of that, huh? Yeah! Start with the part that goes, hello, fork flingers and fricassee Forget fixers. it, forget it. Now, a few ways to substitute non-meat items into your everyday meals and still get the things you get from meat, like cholera, botulism, dysentery. Okay, meat substitute number one, the ever-popular oatmeal. And there it is, Ooh. yummy, huh? Yes, and look, ladies and gentlemen, we're just... With just a few drops of food coloring and a little shaping, watch this, your family will think that this oatmeal is actually real meat. Now watch closely, just shape it up, pat it up, and there it is, look at that. Looks act like actual real meat. Look at that, huh? Okay. It's gonna have a go, it's a little rare. Now, besides oatmeal, how's this for meat substitute number two? Soybeans, yes, the versatile soybean, of which, of course, besides meat, can also be made into cloth, plastic, and even rubber. So instead of meat, serve these delicious soybean dishes. Try cloth parmesan. Oh, isn't that delicious there? Or how about this one here? Roast rack of plastic. Doesn't that look yummy, huh? Good solid uh, hearty food. And of course, uh, filet of sole. Get it? Filet of oh, yeah. sole. That's the oldest meat substitute joke in the world. Now, after more of tonight's flick, Sam Levine, Orson Bean, Jimmy Dean, and Bobby Breen for Valentine Janicki <clears throat> as a cleared throat in Never on Tuesday Well, we'll be back to show you more ways to stretch your meat dollars. <laughs> Get the humor. I'm stretching, stretching the meat, see? It's a rubber steak and I'm stretching it. And throat. Only a miracle can save him. We'll have to give him more blood transfusions. If that's what's needed to save him, I'll be glad to help you, Doctor. We will require at least a couple of men donating their blood in order to save him. I'll find them for you, Doctor. We do not have much time to lose. His pulse is extremely weak. Hurry up. Don't waste a minute. In the meantime, Doctor, I can give you some of my blood. I'll hurry, sir. Is he better, Doctor? You must try to get a little rest, at least for a while. You haven't eaten or had any sleep for days. I thank you. Not for now. Afterwards when I'm quite certain that we have saved him. It all depends on how he passes the night. Won't you have something to drink, at least? Yes, I will. Why isn't she with you? I left her outside. She was playing in the garden. Does the count better? I hope to know in the morning. Please take this. While I'm getting the coffee ready, why don't you have some fruit? No, thank you. Coffee will be enough. I don't need anything else for now. Very well.
Where'd you learn to play that haunting music? I learned it listening to Louise play it the night that you gave the party. I heard it just now as I was lying there in bed. I wondered if Louise could have returned. Do you know where the doctor is? He went in the garden with Daddy to look for the bad man. But what are those men like? I can't imagine. Can you? I feel like walking for a while in the park. Will you come with me? Right now? My father said we mustn't go out at night. You don't need to be afraid. I won't leave you alone. Besides, I want to show you some wonderful new hiding places. in the park at night time. Do you? Please, Wolfgang, answer me. Racy, keep still. Let's get Racy. Not now, please. She won't be hurt. We mustn't let them out of our sight. We'd better not stay here. Why, Vulcan? It's all over now. 
Daddy. He saved me from the vampire. Don't kill him. Stop, Doctor. He saved Gracie from the vampire. I almost killed you. Dear Razy, you've been badly frightened, but now all that has passed. He won't come back here? No, you don't have to worry. Your dolls are waiting to play with you. Go and have fun. Next time, I can tell you many, many stories if you really want me to. Do you? Yes. Goodbye. Bye. I advise you to take good care of her. We must be very careful that what happened to her last night should not affect the development of her tender young mind. But small children quickly forget. With time, all this will be erased. Because as always in nature, there's both good and bad. After every storm, the sun shines. In its light, we see a proof of God's love. Life has many strange secrets, but I think I'm talking too much. Ah, here's the carriage. My bag, Peter. It's taken care of, sir. I just put it in the carriage. Thank you. We'll see you out. <laughs> This is the moment to say goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Nitsch. Just joined us. We're presenting some money-saving meat substitutes tonight, such as mock chicken legs. Now, not yet. <laughs> now, to make mock chicken legs, all you need is a mock chicken. <laughs> a mock chicken. Or you can get a real chicken and mock it yourself. <laughs> finally, finally, people have lost. Mock it yourself, see? Finally. <laughs> People have long known the value of nuts as a meat substitute, right? 
Nut meats have the same nutritional value as meat. So the next time you want a roast beef sandwich, make a nut, make a nut, a nut sandwich. Here's how to make a nut sandwich. First of all, some bread and put the nuts right on there. Be careful not to get any bolts in it. Otherwise, you could ruin the whole sandwich. A few wing nuts is nice. Uh, they're actually chicken wing nuts is what they are. You put the nuts Join right the Galloping Ghoul Maid next there. week when he Open makes... Oh, huh? uh, when he makes... Into that, huh? When he makes a fool of himself <laughs> again. <laughs> I do You can't eat that stuff, folks. Believe me. Ladies and gentlemen, for the next hour and 15 minutes, you will be shown things so terrifying that the management of this theater is deeply concerned for your welfare. Therefore, we request that each of you assume the responsibility of taking care of your neighbor. If anyone near you becomes uncontrollably frightened, will you please notify the management so that medical attention can be rushed to their aid. Please set your watches. It is 6.45 in the evening in a town called Thornton. Broke the lock. Climbed in the window and swiped my best child's coffin. You gonna take fingerprints, Jim? Not right away, Ed. Can't figure out anybody stealing the coffin. 75 bucks worth. 75 bucks is a bereaved 29.50 to you. I'm not in business for my health. Do you think you can find out who did it? Oh, I don't know, maybe. How big was it? Oh, about, what, what about the size of that coffin. You mean a, a guy could carry it? Oh, sure. Sure, it was a kid's coffin. Maybe it was never stolen, and you're going to use the insurance money to bet on the horses. I told you I quit that. Oh, sure, like you gave up playing poker. Just penny ante. Ed, when are you going to pay off some of those debts? Real soon, Jim. You included. Where are you gonna get the money? To charge an old man Weatherby a million bucks for burying Nancy tonight? My rates are the same for everybody. Sure, all you can get. You know what Joe Weatherby said to me when his daughter Nancy died at midnight? He said, you know, my daughter Nancy lived in darkness, died in darkness, and will be buried in darkness. Strangest thing I ever heard of, having a funeral in the middle of the night. Well, you can count on old Joe to do things different from everybody else. <laughs> yeah, like having ten million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even so, it's tough on the old guy, his two daughters dying so suddenly. You never quite got over Alice, did you, Jim? Even after the doc took her away from you. Even after she died. You talk too much, Ed. Well, I got some work to do. Jim. Jim, what about my stolen coffin? I got it right on my mind, Ed. Hey, Doc! How's every little thing? Fine, Tylo. And you? Uh, still taking nourishment. How's your kid? Sit in a week or so. Marge is fine, thanks. She was three last week, wasn't she? You've got a good memory. Yeah, I remember the night your wife died better than you. I was sober. I was with her. Let me give you a little friendly advice. Get out of this town. You're out of business. Think so? They say a good doctor could have saved Nancy the night before last. You know, I just had a childish impulse to take a poke at you.
Not a thing. What are they saying about Nancy Weatherby? That a good doctor could have saved her life, hmm? Polly, what are they trying to do to me? Run me out of town with gossip. It isn't just gossip, Ron. Phallus and Nancy had been just ordinary sisters. It might be different. They were the Weatherby sisters. Richest girls in town. Prettiest. Three years, they're both dead. They can't blame me for Alice's death. My own wife. Rod, they can't blame you, but where were you the night she died? You say you were with Sylvia Stevenson, drunk. One drink, and a doctor's drunk. Now, Nancy, we know that no doctor in the world could have saved her, but you can't make this town believe it. Rod, leave this town. It isn't running away. Just take Marge and go. Take me with you. You suppose Joe Weatherby believes any of it, Polly? Can he help it, Rod? Joe is a fine, wise old man, but his two daughters are dead now, and the whole town's whispering to him. How don't you see how hopeless it is for you to stay here? I'm not going to give Jim Tyler and the rest the satisfaction of seeing me run. Don't suppose I had any patience today? No, no. Oh yes. Yes, one. Sylvia brought Marge in for a second polio shot. She didn't cry a bit. Uh, Marge begged me to come over and put her to bed tonight. You think... Uh, let's go. I'm sick of this place. I tell you, let's take Marge out to the lake for supper tonight. Give her everything that Miss Cushions won't let her have. hiding somewhere. Margie, Polly's here. Good afternoon, Doctor. Hello, Miss Christians. Margie's around? Yeah, she's in her playroom. Oh, I'll go get her. Now, let, let me. Will you please give me just one minute with my daughter alone, Miss Barron? Because as soon as she finds out you're here, that'll be the last I'll see of her. How have you been, Miss Cushions? Very well, thank you. You, um, staying for supper? No, we're going to take Marge out to the lake for supper. Miss Cushions. Yes. I can't find her. Well, she's in there. Well, I know she hasn't come out. Unless she... Must have found a brand new hiding place. Faint signs of her. Well, when did you see her here last? Well, when Sylvia brought her home. She seemed sleepy and all she wanted to do was play with her teddy bear. It was such a sunny afternoon, too. She isn't in here now. Uh, were you here all the time? Of course. Oh, I ran over to Mr. Weatherby's, but I looked in on Margie before I left. She was lying right there on the floor singing to her teddy bear. Well, where is she now? Must be here someplace. Marge! I was only over at Mr. Weatherby's for a minute. Did Marge. you look in on her when you got back, Miss Cushion? I wasn't away that long, Miss Barron. Why, Sylvia? They were together all afternoon. She probably found Miss Cushion's gone, so she went back to Sylvia's. I'll run over there and pick her up. Mix us up a drink, Polly. Where's Marge? Aren't you a little early? I said 8.30. Well, isn't Marge with you? Oh, I dropped her at your house hours ago. Has she run away or something? Maybe she feels a little neglected, darling. The way I do. Now run along. I'll see you at 8.30. Oh, darling, I'm terribly sorry, but I promised to take Marge out to the lake for supper. Anyway, there's Nancy's funeral tonight. 
Polly going to the lake with you? Marge invited her. Oh. I tried to entertain your daughter all afternoon. Oh, why doesn't she like me, Rod? After all, I am going to be her mother. She just doesn't know you very well, darling. She sees so much more of Polly, naturally. Naturally? Rod, aren't you letting Polly get the wrong impression? Polly seems to forget that she's just the nurse in her office. She acts more as though she were your wife. Dr. Barrett's home. No, he's not here. Who's calling, please? Well, yes, he is. She answered it. And, well, she said what a couple of times, and then she fainted. You're, you're all right, Polly. Take it easy. Who was on the phone? Well, how would I know? Now, take it easy. You're all right, Polly. Rod. <laughs> Rod. Marge? She hurt? I don't know. Man, the phone. He must be crazy, Rod. Who was he? I just can't believe anybody would do a thing like that. No, well, what has he done, Polly? Tell me, from the beginning. The phone rang. I didn't stop to think who it was. I just answered it like I do at the office. And it was a man's voice. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me remember it exactly the way he said it. All of it. First he said... Is the doctor? And I said, no, he's not. And then, yes, I, I said, who's calling, please? He didn't answer me. He just laughed. <laughs> that voice, that horrible laugh. And then what? Well, he, he stopped laughing after a while. He said, I guess the doctor's out looking for his little girl. <laughs> Rod, I was so concerned about Marge, I didn't stop to think. I was, I was so sure he was going to tell me where she was. Is that wrong, Rod? I said, yes, you were. Well, I was. Go on. And he started laughing again. Go on. And then he said, tell the doc that Marge's funeral has just taken place, and now she's with the dead. What do you mean, Polly? That's what he said, Rod. Marge's funeral had just taken place and she was with the dead. And... Marge... dead? No, no way. Wait. Then he said... Dead, tell the doc that she's not dead. Not yet. That she's in a good... big coffin for her that there might still be time enough to find him. Four, five hours. Buried alive. In a coffin. Not my little lamb. Oh, nobody could do that to my dear, sweet darling. Nobody. What are you going to do, Miss Cushions? I'm going to call the police. No. Rob, you better call it. No! You forget about Jeff Tattle, Polly? You'd do anything to hurt me. Even let Marge die. Do something, Rod. Well, are you just gonna stand there and do nothing while my own little left? Her funeral has just taken place. With the dead. But wasting a lot of time, Rod. There isn't much left. We need help.
help, Polly. We need a whole town full of people to help us search everywhere. I don't know a single man or woman in this town that I could trust except Sylvia. I'll have to do it by myself. You trust Sylvia, not me? I'm sorry you said that, Polly. I'll get some shovels. There's a flashlight up in my room. Another in the car. Miss Cushions, I'm going out to the graveyard now to look for Marge. If anybody finds out where I am, they might try to stop me. I don't want you to tell anybody anything, Miss Cushions. Do you think for one minute I would do anything that could harm my Marge? Oh. Miss Cushions, that includes Marge's grandfather. You're not to run over there or telephone, you understand? But Mr. Weatherby should know about this. After all, he'll want to find her as much as you do. Miss Cushions, you know his heart condition. Do you want to kill Mr. Weatherby? And I advise you not to tell him what has happened to Marge. came back from Sylvia's. Somebody put it there. It's got dirt on it. This isn't topsoil. It's clay. Deep down. Grave is deep. for the funeral, Miss Cushions. Well, I know, sir, but I had to see you. Marge has been buried alive in a coffin. place will make it go faster. So many, Polly. She could be anywhere in any one of them. He really has buried her, Rod. He couldn't do it without leaving a trace. Let's look for 
grave that's been tampered with. Fresh dirt, now. got to think like the man who did this. It's the only way we're going to find Marge. There are four or five upright citizens in this town who hate me enough or are cruel enough or crazy enough to bury a child alive. I can't think like any of them. All we can do is search every inch of this ground for fresh digging. No, I heard something. he wanted us to do. Just wandering, helpless. Perhaps. But if he's dug into this ground anywhere, we'll find Marge. And in time, too. He's planned it this way. He'll be watching us right now. Laughing like he did on the phone. Following us. Of course he's out here. With a mind twisted enough to bury a child alive, of course he'd want to see me suffer. See it, not just imagine it. He's got the knife in my back, and now he's twisting it and standing out there laughing. That's part of it. Who is it, Polly? Who is it? Do you see that? No. They moved out there. Nerves. Seeing things that don't exist. Something moved. This isn't just nerves, Rod. Something moved. I saw it. We're fools. Nancy's funeral tonight. They've been digging her grave, and that's where that dirt on the teddy bear came from. Oh, yes. Come on. Have you got a match? 
No, but I can lend you a cigarette lighter. I've got now, one. Now, how am I going to pick my teeth with a cigarette lighter? Huh? Never thought of that. <laughs> Zelda, listen, you're just in time, baby, for Svenguli song time, huh? <laughs> Zelda, well, listen, what does she know about music? She doesn't have any ears anyway. Hey, listen, how would you like to hear the art link letter song, huh? The art link letter song? Sure, here it goes, the art link letter song. I'm gonna sit right down and right to our link letter. <laughs> you didn't like that. Okay, one chicken per song, please. Don't get pushy. How about the Henry Kissinger song? Huh? Oh, Henry Kissinger song. <laughs> yes. I wonder, Hank kissing her now. Hank oh, kissing her. Yeah. Is it that one? Yeah. That wasn't even worth the chicken. Okay, one more. How about the Hugh O'Brien song? The huh? Hugh O'Brien song? Yes. Don't let the sun catch you, O'Brien. I can't believe it. So much for you. Well, okay, that's enough of the B material. Zelda, come back in here, Zelda. <laughs> Listen, Zelda, I got a great treat for you. Wait, look, wait, wait, like cool the press here. Okay. Stop dancing while, while I'm talking. But you play anyway. Go in there. Okay, listen. How would you like to sing a duet with Svengoli? <laughs> she blew the chance to sing a duet. Z Zelda, come back here. <laughs> now listen, I want you to sing a duet with me. Well, I couldn't sing one without you. Oh, no, you could. <laughs> no way. Okay, hit it, baby. Here we go. Take it. Pack up plasmas A and B and typo. That's for me. Bye bye, blood bank. Far out, huh? Please don't use the turn in the cat. I need all I can get. Bye bye. Blood bank. Take it. Thank you. That's all right. I'd bite sailors' necks, but I can't try it. Why not? Cause you see, I'm on a salt-free diet. Get it, sailor salt, salt. salt? I hated it. No, stunk. So, so send, send me a, a pint, pint or more. Not, not for, for sale in any store. store. Blood bank. Bye bye, ay ay ay, blood bank. Bye bye. bye. Yes, sir. Sunny and Cher, eat your hearts out. <laughs>
What are you doing down there? I'm a caretaker. Who's down there? find that man the gun thought maybe she was down in nancy's grave what is happening rod why must i look for my granddaughter in the grave of my daughter why rod why i blame myself rod i tried but she was always rushing through her own world of darkness rushing everywhere getting nowhere nancy Nancy. Faster! Faster! Tell me where we're going a hundred miles an hour. I want to live fast, love fast, and die fast. Take your foot off the gas, Miss Weatherby. There's a cop behind us. Anyway, I can't steer going this fast. Well, if it isn't my little old blonde built-in headache. When'd you get back, Nancy? <laughs> Yesterday. Would you like to hear me say something in Italian, Spanish, German? Or do you prefer French, Jimbo? Meet anybody interesting over there? Only men. Those foreign docs help you any? Nope. I'll be blind forever and ever. I see you got yourself a new chauffeur. Isn't he darling? <laughs> Nick, this is Jim Tylo. He'll be arresting us every hour on the hour. Hey, Jim, you know this thing can really travel? Yeah, and it can kill you, too. Is that bad, Jim? Bad for other people. They've got the edge. They can see me. Nick, take this heap home. I'm riding with the chief of police. I'm going to catch up on all the gossip. It's nice having you back, Nancy. Same old Jimbo. How's Rod Barrett? You uh, gonna stay home a while? Oh, I don't know. Dad says he's fine, but he doesn't sound fine. Alice dying like that hit him pretty hard. Hit you pretty hard, too, didn't it, Jim? should I get married? All men seem alike in the dark. I'm serious. I'm serious, too. Jim, you're the last man in the world that I'd marry because I don't want leftovers. Oh, listen, honey. Be honest, Jim. You know you love Alice. 
You loved her even when Rod married her. And you love her now, even when she's dead. But I do understand, Jimbo. Come on. Let's blow the siren all the way home. You call me that one more time, I'll have you fired. What are you doing here? Nothing. You know something, Miss Nancy? One of these times you're going to dive in there, and there isn't going to be any water. <laughs> Come on in. I've got my clothes on. What difference does that make to me? Not about it, Nancy. So, what do I do now, Ron? Marry him. Let's say it was person or persons unknown. It's the only solution, Nancy, unless you go away somewhere for a while. You have it born blind the way I've been all my life? Rod, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not just going to marry some man, either. I don't want to be a wife, and I won't be a mother. I just want to be what I've been all my life. Nothing. So? No. What if Dad finds out? What would that do to him? It could be serious. Another heart attack. Exactly. I'm the only thing that Dad has now, Rod. He's proud of me. God knows why. And he loves me. And if he finds out... I'm only a doctor, Nancy. I have no power, no authority to weigh one human life against another. Won't you help me and tell me what to do? How can I, Nancy? I'm a doctor. <laughs> Dr. Barron. How badly? Well, get her to the hospital right away. I'll be there. What? Never mind that now. Quickly, get going. Always rushing through our own world of darkness. Rushing everywhere. Getting nowhere. Nancy. Nancy. Alice is gone. Nancy is gone. All I have left, Rod, is Marge. I'll find her, son. We will, Jod. But you shouldn't be out here. Oh, wanted to help if I could. There's nothing you can do. Where do you think she is? Here. Somewhere. Uh, don't let anyone know you're out here. Or they'll stop you. Oh, find her, please. You killed him, Joan. This is bad for all of us. Until Marge is safe, no one must know that Hummel is dead. If Jim Tylo finds... No one. Joan, you can't stay out here now. 
Polly, take him to my house. Marge? Oh, Mr. Weatherby, what have they done with my baby? Who was the last person to see the child? Sylvia Stevenson brought her home. Then you were the last, Miss Cushing. Yes, I, I, I suppose so. Except whoever took her away. You've taken care of the Weatherbys all your life, haven't you? First Mrs. Weatherby, then Alice and Nancy, and now it's March. A lifetime. But the end is coming, isn't it? When the doctor marries Mrs. Stevenson, there'll be no place near Marge for you. You don't think... There is still time, Miss Cushion. Hello? Holly? Have you... No. Now listen. Think back hard, that phone call. Where exactly did he say Marge was? In her coffin. Out here? Well, he didn't say where, but the, the teddy bear had cemetery dirt on it. That could have been smeared on later. Now try to remember. Did he say that she had been buried? He said that her funeral had just taken place and that she was with the dead. It's wrong. Funeral? With the dead? Nancy is dead. Oh, Rod, not in the same coffin with Nancy. I'm going to Quigley Funeral Parlor. I'll go with you. No, Polly. No, I want to. Where are you? Oh, all right. But not in front. In the alley. He thinks she's with Nancy? I will phone you if anything... Polly, I alone have the right to open Nancy's coffin.
Tell me. Breathing artificial. Just mechanical pump. Sounds like breathing. See? A motor driven bellows under the cask. It sounds so lifelike for the bereaved. What have you done with her? Wait, wait. <laughs> done with who? What? Marge, what have you done with her? Nothing done. Nothing done. I haven't seen her for weeks. What's happened? You buried her alive, Quigley. Buried her alive? Me, Mr. Weatherby? Wait. Wait, I, I, I don't know anything about it. Buried alive. Oh, my God. Why do you think I, I do a thing like that? Wait. Wait, wait. You, 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 you're all wrong. I, Honest to God. I don't know anything about Mark. I think he's telling the truth, Rod. Now listen, Quigley. Keep your mouth shut about Marge, you understand? We're going out to the graveyard and have a look. We're all going to the graveyard, Doc. Good evening, Mr. Weatherby. Tyler. Somebody swipe another coffin, Ed? Huh? What's this about a stolen coffin? Somebody broke in here last night and stole a child's coffin. At least that's what Ed says. Hummel here yet? I haven't seen him. Is that the way you dress for a funeral, Doc, with dirt all over? Very good change. Jim. Jim, I couldn't get Hummel on the phone. Old man's never been late before. Hummel or no Hummel, we better get rolling. We'll help you load up. You don't mind helping, do you, Doc? Do. This is my... Time's running out. Well, well. You know that coffin that Jim was talking about? You couldn't walk around town carrying a coffin. A car? Hmm? A truck? Like Hummels or a hearse, like Ed's. Who else could drive out to this graveyard with a coffin in broad daylight without everybody in town wondering why? Hummel in a truck or Edna Hurst? No one would question Jim Tyler either. Well, I'd look. But many people could have done it, but who would do it? Somebody. 
they were a little crazy, might think Marge would be better off with her mother. Better off? And turned over to a woman like Sylvia, who only wanted to use Marge as a stepping stone to her own ambition. Maybe that's why they call them stepmothers. It's enough, Polly. <laughs> Oh, this isn't it. This is just part of the pattern, putting fresh dirt on graves that make us dig and waste time. All right, Polly. Out with it. The things they said about Alice. Blaming me for her death? Nancy, Cushions, Jim Tylo, everybody. Do you? No, not physically. What do you mean, not physically? Not with your hands. Not with poison. You and Sylvia. When Alice was so sick with Marge and the whole town talking. Alice Weatherby, now your husband's going to blame me for this. Oh, sure, sure. Alice. Hello, Polly. <laughs> you look as though you'd seen a ghost. <laughs> it's just been such a long time. So, Miss Cushions? Um, the doctor's busy now. I'll tell him you're here. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rod. Your wife is here, Doctor. Alice, here? Now, about lunch. I'll do my best, Sylvia. I won't accept that. Country Club, one o'clock. Alice, what in the world? Hello, darling. Surprise. Hello, Sylvia. Alice, it's so good to see you up and about. It's been so long. I must rush now. Goodbye, Alice. Bye-bye, Rod. Alice, really? This is very foolish, Miss Cushions. Oh, don't blame me. I tried my best to stop her. Oh, I'm just so tired of staying in bed all the time. Nine months, Rod. Alice, when we decided, you knew the danger. This is the worst thing you could do. But I feel much better today. Rod, I want you to take me for a drive in the country, and then we can have lunch somewhere. I, I even want a cocktail. Darling, the only drive you're going to take is straight back home. Oh, Rod. Oh, please, just, just a little drive, and then just lunch somewhere. Alice, please. The time is so short now. Just take it easy for a little while. Miss Cushions will drive you home now, darling. Couldn't you drive me home and then, oh, just stay long enough for lunch, dear? Uh, I'd like to, but I've got appointments all afternoon. All right, off you go, darling. Be very careful in the streets, Miss Cushions. Sven Gulli reenacts another great hysterical... Historical! A uh, historical moment from the past that's happened already uh, before. Tonight, the gunfight at OK Corral. Partner, when I count to three, go for your gun. One, two, three. Hey, where are you going? 
I, I'm going for my gun. It, yeah, it's, it's in Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia. No, no that's not. Yeah. No, no, I didn't. No, I didn't mean that. But stop that guy. Hey, <laughs> but you made him. No, listen. What I meant, what I said, go for the gun. I meant reach in the holster and take the gun and shoot him in the. You can't. <laughs> Dr. Barrett come? No, I don't know where he is. Thanks, Sylvia. I'm worried about Alice. She shouldn't have gotten up today. Well, you've got to relax sometime, Rod. I don't really need this, you know. Just being here with you is enough. These past months have been hard on you, Rod. You've become so tense. Has me worried a lot. You've got to think of yourself a little, Rod. You're simply too good to waste your talents in a town like this. Excuse me. Hello? Uh, is Dr. Barrett there, Sylvia? No, I'm afraid not. You know where he is? No, I'm sorry, I don't. It's been a terrible time for you and Alice, hasn't it? A friend is a wonderful thing to have. You know, you've just about saved my life this past year. That's what I'm here for, Rod. To help all I can. You can't live continually with sickness. Is Dr. Barrett in? He's not at Sylvia's or his office at the hospital. Well, we can't waste any more time. Where's Rod? Get Rod right over me! Please! Please! Oh, no. Don't! No, it's Rod! Right. Oh, don't! Oh, no. It's all right! Oh, get Jim! Jim Tyler! Oh, quick! Oh! Oh, Al! Oh, Rod! Rod, where are you? Doc, how'd you get in here? Walk. Something on your mind, Jim? Nothing much. Must be pretty important to keep you up this late. Well, I'd come by and congratulate you, Doc. Me? What about? You're the father of a seven-pound daughter. sick with Marge. The whole town talking. I think you're a good doctor. But Sylvia has ruined you as a man just the way she ruined her first husband. And I think she's ruined you as a father. The way you neglect Marge is shame. You've never been fair about Sylvia. Not even honest with yourself. I wonder... You've watched me suffer now for hours, haven't you? Watch this thing take me apart. But it hasn't been enough for you, not yet. So you'll wait. You'll wait until you're sure I can't take it one minute more. Are you doing it to teach me a lesson? Or to make me so grateful to you for saving my child that I'll forget all about Sylvia? Is that it? But the phone call. How do I know there was a phone call? That was a dandy while it lasted. Besides fist fighting, what else are you two doing out here? You forget, Jim. Nancy's funeral, remember? 
A couple of shovels at the wrong grave. Jim, listen. Holly? Someone has taken Marge and buried her alive in a coffin. Help us to find her, Jim, please. What all oh, They've looked everywhere out here. That's it. Now, wait a minute. This is my family's tomb. It's locked and it's been locked. You got a key? No, Hummel keeps it. Nobody can get in. this doc no that figures time has run out Nancy Willoughby emerged from the utter darkness of her life into the eternal sunshine of your heavenly presence we pray unto thee that at the time of judgment, the burden of blindness, which Nancy Weatherby carried with her all her life, be balanced in the scales against her trespasses. Forgive this child of darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and hold her blameless, just as throughout her short life, she blamed no one for her great affliction. Have mercy upon her. Let your light shine upon and console this, our departed sister. Amen. You too, Doc.
crazy. I didn't do it. Look at his pockets. Take it back. And take it with you. Because it's all you'll ever touch again. Why'd you shoot him, Ed? Nobody stole this coffin. He made me put it here. I made this thing. He brought the dress and hat. Everybody was hounding me about my debts. You too, Jim. And he promised me all I needed if I'd help Nance. Doc could have saved her. But he let her die. Then he said I was to bless it. Then he started in on Joe Dweatherby. Talking him into having Nancy buried at midnight. Then letting him hear that Marge had been buried alive. Doc made me build that breathing thing in my funeral parlor. Doc never let up on the old man. Killing him with one shock after another. <laughs> Joe Dweatherby was tougher than you thought, Doc. It took you almost five hours to shock him to death. All you had to do was put heart failure in the death certificate and no one would have questioned it. Help it! Jim, help! All right. I'll take you to the hospital. My office. Go there first. All right. Come on, you two. with Alice and three years more but Nancy in the way she died I knew I could get it all only took me five hours Polly it was perfect I guess the doc's out looking for his little girl <laughs> now I can leave this down <laughs> Take March. <laughs> Tell the doctor to and leave. I just your list is just now. taken place. And now she's with the dead. Tell the doc she's not dead. Not yet. Tell the doc she's in a good big coffin for her <laughs> so there might be time to find her for five hours <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please do not, I repeat, please do not reveal the ending of this picture to your friends, as it will spoil their enjoyment of it.
be no casualties and that you are all in the best of health. But... We hope you've been...